Welcome back to our video module on dynamics. I'd like to pick up where we left off. Previously, we had looked at the acceleration and seen that it has a radial component and an angular component in polar coordinates. The first thing we looked at was our centripetal acceleration. We see that this is very similar, can be visualized, I should say, if you have a rock rotating around some pivot and we draw our free body diagram, we see that the tension, here let's draw a vector symbol there, is equal to the acceleration. This is pulling on the rope. Next was the angular acceleration. Here we're accelerating something around a pivot point. And here we say that the force was going purely in the angular direction. Finally, we saw, we took a look at radial acceleration. And this is just something accelerating straight from the origin or straight away. We had a, uh, mass on a slider and we're just pushing that mass along. Now one thing worth noting here is F equals MA, our old standby equation. What we know in this is that the direction of the force and the direction of the acceleration are always exactly the same. Today I'd like to take a look at this component here which we labeled the Coriolis acceleration and try to get an understanding of it. So I've copied our acceleration equation down here, and I'd like to find what type of setup would reflect only a Coriolis acceleration. First, we know that everything happening in the radial direction must be zero. So acceleration in the radial direction needs to go to zero. In addition, we need this term to drop out. Remember, our Coriolis acceleration is only right here. In order to make that happen, we know theta double dot, that is going to be zero. What we're left with is only the Coriolis acceleration, something that has these characteristics. What might it look like? We can imagine that we have a rod, and on that rod is a, uh, is a ball bearing or a slider, something that it really freely moves in the radial direction with no friction but we can apply a force perpendicular. And we will give this, um, this rod some sort of angular velocity. Let's draw just a quick sketch to give you a feel of what that would look like if we look at it really closely. You might have something that looks like this. And of course, it's free to slide in either of these directions. Let's take a look at what a free body diagram would look like for this setup. We're only looking at the slider and we see that the only force acting on it is the force of the rod on the slider designated here as a normal force. Let's remember what our um, polar unit vectors are. And we see that that force is not, because it's frictionless, is not doing anything in the radial direction and is only acting in the theta direction. So in other words, if we resume our next step of writing the sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration, we see that whatever that normal force is must be equal to the mass times just this component of the acceleration, which is 2 r dot theta dot e theta. Here's Andy Ruina at Cornell demonstrating this setup. I'm going to turn this thing like this and I'm going to put a bead on here and I'm going to make it frictionless. Okay, so then I put this here like this and I'm going to flick my wrist around and this is going to fly across the room. Okay. Now, actually, it's rather dramatic what happens, and I hope I don't cause damage. I want to find this afterwards so I could maybe do this more than one time. Are you ready? Now, this is a far less intuitive result than what we got when we looked at the other three. Let's scroll down and see if we can understand a little bit about what's happening here. First, we can imagine that the rod is in its original orientation drawn on um, the e theta and the er vectors 
and what we see is that the rod or I'm sorry the um, the slider is right here and we see that there's a force and that force is acting in this direction the force is acting in this direction therefore the acceleration is acting in this direction only in the theta direction not in the r direction however let's imagine that just a split second later this rod has rotated now a split second later we now have a new er just the uh, er in teal and the e theta in teal and the acceleration of the particle is in gray is in the direction of gray and you can see that a good portion of that acceleration is going in the direction of e theta of teal but you have some of it if we were to draw if we were to draw what this looks like in yellow this section right here is going in the same direction as the teal a split second later but some of it some of the acceleration some of the change is going to be uh, acting in the radial direction of the coordinate frame a split second later. The acceleration is still only in the e theta direction but a result of that acceleration is that you have a change in the radial distance. This is going to be non-zero. So we see an acceleration in the theta direction ends up causing some sort of second derivative of the radial distance. Another way to think of that is that the acceleration in just the radial direction looks like this. We have r double dot minus r theta dot squared er. And if you recall, we said that this whole value goes to zero. Now, if r double dot is non-zero, that tells us that what we're really seeing is that the acceleration of the particle in the r double dot direction is equal to r theta dot squared, which was our centripetal acceleration. So while the radial acceleration, er, it's overall zero, we see that the components are non-zero. Another way that we could look at this is from an energy perspective. We know that the kinetic, en kinetic energy of something like this is going to be one half i omega squared. We know we have some sort of work in as it requires a force to maintain that constant angular velocity. So we know that this is going to be increasing. The kinetic energy is increasing because we're putting work in. The angular velocity, this is going to be a constant, which means that the only thing that can be changing is going to be our polar moment of inertia. And in fact, when we have a particle, it has a small polar moment of inertia when it's very close to the center, medium here, and the further it gets out, the polar moment of inertia increases. If we wanted to look at this quantitatively, we could identify the polar moment of inertia based on a radius, and we could see that um, that would be equal to the change in kinetic energy, or we plug that in, and that would be, tell us the change in kinetic energy or our work in. Finally, we could try to look not just at the effects of a Coriolis acceleration, but what, at its basis, it really is. We know that the acceleration is the change in the velocity for unit time. And with the Coriolis acceleration, there's actually two things that are changing. First, you can imagine that you have a constant r dot. You have some particle moving away from the center at some r dot, and then you're going to change its angular velocity. So you have this particle, it's moving this way, and your change is going to then change its velocity in this direction that is going to be some acceleration, a change in velocity per unit time. So the changing part is theta dot, and we'll say, I don't know, in yellow, this is our constant. The other way that we could look at it is we're going to say that we have some particle, and it is, uh, 
once again r theta dot and this time its angular acceleration is staying the same which means out here it's rotating we have our theta dot and then what we're going to do is we're going to introduce a change in the radial velocity so we're going to while it's rotating in this direction it's going to keep that angular velocity we're going to change its radial velocity and we end up with now a particle up here we combine both of these terms first term second term and that is the influencing factor why we have a two there's two physical manifestations of the same effect. So in summary we can see that our Coriolis acceleration is one of four components of our overall polar acceleration. It's tricky to understand and we can think of it lots of ways either just looking at the equation from an energy perspective. We can think of it over here when we looked at the change in the unit vectors or we can look at it here as changes in r dot and theta dot. I hope this slider rod setup gives you a more intuitive and elementary understanding of what the Coriolis acceleration does and looks like in real life. Thank you and I look forward to seeing you in our next module.